It's where pink goes. Is it? Yeah. I'm looking at your face. All right. Um, we've <laughs> seen these these martyrs at the base of the altar, <coughs> given white robes, but he but God says, I want you to wait a little bit. And so everybody always says, okay, where are these? You know, and again, these are symbols. It's not necessarily the way it is, but here's some. <laughs> Uh, diagrams that I've used in the past to kind of explain what scripture may support in that there are, you know, when your body dies, you either go to paradise with Lazarus, the Jesus, the thief on the cross, he says, today you will be with me in paradise. There's a great gulf um, that we get when uh, the rich man says, you know, can I not, uh, whatever, he says, you can't get across this great gulf. Uh, then there's this resurrection judgment, the final judgment, and then separation into heaven and hell. Um, and it's, you know, it's got some scriptures here. Um, and on the back side, uh, there's a lot more scriptures, um, you know, except pointing to uh, where people go. Aliens go, who are the unfaithful go, where do the faithful go, where do infants go. Uh, Etc. So, um, just in case you wanted to see that, you may like that. I used to keep a copy in my Bible, and then my Bible, uh, uh, some Windex fell over in the car and <laughs> turned all the pages blue and made it stink for a very long time. So. Did your dog eat it? No, my dog. <laughs> uh, if I'd left it at his house, yes, it probably would. Uh, so. <coughs> My dog loves cardboard. Um, all right, so uh, all right, so we're at this. The, we're at the sixth seal, and your header may say uh, tear. Uh, and one of the things I do in this study is give you what I think the translation is, and then back it up with scripture. I could have done it the other way around, but. For some reason, I did it that way. So what I'm going to do is say, okay, this this equals this, and that's what that little arrow means. These symbols, this great earthquake, this black as sackcloth, this moon became as blood, indicate judgment. So if someone would read uh, chapter 6, verses 12 through 17, um, we'll get going. I looked when he broke the sixth seal, and there was great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood. And the stars of the sky fell over the earth as a fig tree casts its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Then the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the presence of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Okay, thank you. All right, uh, now, everybody always immediately goes to the end of time. You know, the stars fall from the sky. The sky is rolled up as a scroll. Do we have a song that says that? We do, don't we? Anybody recall what it is? No? Um, so we have a song that says, and, you know, and this, this kind of says, well, this is the end of the world. And so everybody says, okay, you know, you know this is what I'm going to look for. When the stars start to fall, and they're looking into the heavens and say, okay, we've got, we got a meteor shower coming, or, you know, whatever. The earth will be destroyed by a meteorite. Um, etc. Uh, but here I'm going to make the case that it isn't, this isn't the end times. These aren't symbols of the end times uh, or the end of the earth. Um, so the following that I'm going to read you out of Isaiah 13, 29, 50, Jeremiah, Joel, uh, are all related to earthly kingdoms, to nations or peoples, and they all past, but they have very similar symbols. Um, Isaiah 13, 10, God judges Babylon with these words. He says, the stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light, 
<laughs> the rising sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give us light. I will punish the world for its evil, the wicked for their sins. I will put an end to the arrogance of the haughty, and will humble the pride of the ruthless. I will make man scarcer than pure gold, more rare than the gold of Ophir. Therefore I will make the heavens tremble, and the earth will shake from its place the wrath of the Lord Almighty in the day of his burning anger. Now is that the final judgment, or is this an intermediate judgment, the judgment of Babylon? Isaiah 29, suddenly, in an instant, the Lord Almighty will come with thunder and earthquake and great noise, with windstorm and tempest and flames of devouring fire. Isaiah 50, verse 3, I clothe the sky with darkness and make sackcloth its off its covering. Jeremiah 4, 23 and 28, I looked at the earth and it was formless and empty, and at the heavens and their light was gone. I looked at the mountains and they were quaking. All the hills were swaying. I looked and there were no people. Every bird in the sky had flown away. And I looked and the fruitful land was a desert and its towns lay in ruins before the Lord, before his fierce anger. This is what the Lord says. The whole land will be ruined, though I will not destroy it completely. Therefore the earth will mourn and the heavens above grow dark because I have spoken and I will not relent and I have decided and will not turn back. And from Joel chapter 2, verse 31, the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So, um, notice it says before the day of the Lord and not on the day of the Lord. Um, so, these symbols that we're seeing here, um, earthquake, uh, the sun became black as sackcloth, uh, and the moon became like blood are symbols of an impending judgment. Okay. Do you agree with that? Or? Okay. Um, the stars fell to the earth. Um, so the stars of heaven, your verse may say the stars of heaven. And mine says the stars of the sky fell to the earth. Um, so perhaps that's a mistranslation. Many go back into Isaiah, um, and we'll probably get there, uh, 1412. Um, we'll get there in just a second. So I, I say that the stars, or a number of people say, the stars are symbols of earthly rulers. Uh, these are people who, you know, powerful, um, you know, high up. Um, <coughs> rulers, uh, leaders, uh, Numbers 24, 17, a star will come out of Jacob, a scepter will rise out of Israel, he will crush the foreheads of Moab and the skulls of all the sons of, of Sheth. And Isaiah 14, 12, oh, or how you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn, you have been cast down to the earth, you once um, you who once laid low the nations. Now, a lot of people say that's the word Lucifer, okay? which is interesting. Because, that's what my Bible says, right. Lucifer. Uh, but it's interesting that Lucifer is a Latin term. How in the world in the Old Testament, the Testament was written in what? Hebrew. Hebrew. Why did people stick in the word Lucifer there? A Latin word. Okay. <laughs> But it's because Lucifer means what? You ever heard, you know, give me your Lucifer to light my cigarette? You ever heard that? No. <laughs> well, I, no, I don't smoke, but I, I read a lot. Someone okay? around you does. <laughs> a Lucifer is a light. It's a, it's a flash of light, okay? And that's all that means in Latin. It's, it's a flame, okay? A small portion of a flame. That's all that means. Now, you put a capital L on that, and that's a person's name, or that relates to, to Satan. And, of course, Satan was thrown down from heaven, but I think it's saying that leaders have been thrown down from their official positions. Okay? I'm not one in Isaiah to say that this is prophetic of the war in heaven where, where Lucifer, or Satan, was cast out from heaven. Um, 
Let's go on to Daniel 8, verse 10. When speaking of the transition of power from ruler to rulers and the overthrow of other rulers, we get this. Goat became very great, but at the height of his power, his large horn, again, that's the symbol of power, of ruling, was broken off, and in its place, four prominent horns grew up towards the four winds of heaven. Out of one of them came another horn, which started small, but grew in power to the south and to the east and towards the beautiful land. It grew until it reached the hosts of the heavens, and it threw some of the starry hosts <coughs> down to the earth and trampled on them. So, stars falling to earth may mean many earthly rulers will fall because of this, uh, this judgment of God. Now, um, stars are rulers, so who is the morning star? Jesus. Now you just, right? It's the first star that you see in the morning, and it's in the east or western sky. Eastern sky. Okay. That's the east is always spoken of as is the direction from which hope comes, because it's the direction in which the, the the sun rises, and that's our number one star. But it's also the morning star, and Jesus is known as the morning star. In fact, we went through that. He says, I am the morning star. It says so at the end of Revelation as well, that he is the great and morning star, uh, the great and last hope uh, for all the true hope. Um, so the sky vanished as a scroll. What does that symbol imply to us? So from Isaiah 34.4. All the stars of heaven will be dissolved, and the sky rolled up like a scroll. All the starry host will fall like withered leaves from the vine, like shriveled figs from the fig tree. Um, their regime and all those with them will roll up. Uh, every mountain and island was removed from its place. The mountains are symbols of permanence and strength, and the islands are symbols of the nation's possessions and their security. We get that from a couple places in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 26, 15 to 18. This is what the sovereign Lord says to Tyre. Will not the coastlands or the islands tremble at the sound of your fall when the wounded groan and the slaughter takes place in you? Then all the princes of the coast, or the islands, step down from their thrones and lay aside their robes and take off their embroidered garments. Clothed with terror, they will sit on the ground, trembling every moment, appalled at you. Then they will take up a lament concerning you and say to you how you are destroyed, O city of renown, peopled by men of the sea. You are a power on the seas, and you and your citizens you put your terror on, on all who live there. Now the coastlands, or the islands, tremble on the day of your fall. The islands and the sea are terrified at your collapse. And Ezekiel 27, 35. Now you are shattered by the sea in the depths of the waters. Your waves and all your company have gone down with you. All who live in the coastlands or the islands are appalled at you. Their kings shudder with horror, and their faces are distorted with fear. Okay? Are you following the imagery? Okay? It's kind of obscure to us, maybe, but if you go back to the Old Testament, here's these parallels uh, with the symbol and what is happening at the time. Uh, verse 15 says, uh, Then the kings of the earth and the great men and commanders and rich and the strong and every slave and freed man hid themselves in caves and among the rocks and the mountains. And everybody says, okay, because the meteorites are, sh are coming down to earth, everybody says, I'm going to run to the cave. That's the only safe place is let's hide in the earth. Um, all right, but I think we have to go back into the Old Testament to see, you know, what it, what it says. Um, listed here are all classes of people. There's kings, there's rulers, there's rich, there's strong, there's slaves, there's free men. Uh, so all men are affected. They hid in the caves, and they said, Fall on us and hide us from the face of the one seated on the throne. The great 
and uh, it'll be their great day of their wrath, not the great day of wrath. Um, so it all speaks to an earthly judgment. So uh, Hosea 10.8 says, The high places of wickedness will be destroyed. It is the sin of Israel. Thorns and thistles will grow up and cover the altars. Then they will say to the mountains, Cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. That's exactly the same words, is it not? Okay. Is that is that saying we have to hide from meteorites at the last, you know, at the end of the earth? No, I think this these are symbols of God's judgment that come upon the earth. Now, if you go back to Roman history, you go back to the rulers killing one another, and they set up all these kingdoms, and there's there's two or three Caesars at one time. They fight against them each other. They have um, they succeed each other by multiple murders and. Praetorian guard decides to replace one guy with somebody else so to kill that guy and put his and him in his place. Uh, we have rulers that disappear to islands uh, and build a temple there and hide there because they're so afraid they'll be murdered that they hide off in the islands. Okay. Um, I can't remember the, the, the one that did that. Uh, but they still found him and killed him. <laughs> and <replaced> him. <laughs> Okay. Uh, you know, so it fits history, <clears throat> but I think it speaks of um, uh, earthly judgment or, or temporary judgment. Uh, Isaiah chapter 2, 17 to 22. Uh, the arrogance of man will be brought low, and the pride of men humbled. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day, and the idols will totally disappear. Men will flee to the caves and the rocks and to holes in the ground from the dread of the Lord uh, and the splendor of his majesty when he rises to shake the earth. And that day men will throw away to the rodents and bats their idols of silver and idols of gold which they made to worship. They will flee to the caverns and the rocks and to the overhanging crags from the dread of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty when he rises to shake the earth. Stop trusting in man who has but breath in his nostril. Of what account is he? Okay, so you're a second century Roman. Uh, you see turmoil in your government. Um, bread is becoming scarce. The plagues are raging. Um, you continue to sacrifice to your... Uh, your trade god to all the deities to the emperor and things still get worse and everybody's blaming the Christians because the Christians aren't participating and therefore they must be the problem but then you say well, you know if if we were doing the the what, what did I call it the uh, I uh, can't think of it. real early in the, in the book. The, the fights. Um, I have to go back. I'm not a very good teacher, and you're not very good students for not remembering. <laughs> 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 We're all asleep this morning. That's right. Ah, <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, come on. Can't think of Peace of the Gods. Pa de Orm. The Peace of the Gods. So they said, okay. The reason why we have it so good is we're pleasing the gods and everybody sacrifices to God. But when it starts to fall apart, everybody says, okay, I'm going to give up on these things that aren't working. Okay? Isn't that what he says here? They're going to throw their idols to the, to the animals that live in the caves because they aren't working. Um, they're going <coughs> to say, hey, wait a minute, this isn't working. The terror comes on. People start to realize the terror. Are you getting a little bit of that these days? Okay. Everybody's pointing to Israel. What happens if there's a nuclear war and all that kind of stuff? Are we so not afraid of a nuclear war anymore? How many of you were little kids and had to hide underneath your desk? Okay. Well, I grew up in Los Alamos. My dad was on several nuclear blasts. I was on two. Um, he was a physicist at Los Alamos. Um, and I remember being a young kid, we had a drill, we had to get in the car and drive the whole family down to the 
place, get on a big <coughs> elevator that went way, way, way down on the ground. And it was a bomb shelter and had food and bunks and, and all that kind of stuff because Los Alamos was one of those places targeted for nuclear weapons. And, um, you know, we just, we just thought someday it'll come. In fact, um, her parents had a, had a duplex or triplex, tri yes, duplex. Triplex. they had a bomb shelter under their house on the other end. They did not build it. Somebody else built it. Somebody else built it. I mean, we, you know, we, we live in these days where you may say, I can't rely on this world anymore. Now, uh, I, I think this is pointing back there, but, you know, I think there's echoes through time that, that come our way. Um, all right, so the great day of their wrath, who is able to stand? We'll go back to Isaiah 13, 9. See, the day of the Lord is coming, a cruel day, with wrath and fierce anger to make the land desolate, to destroy the sinners within it. And Joel 2, 11, <coughs> the Lord thunders at the head of his army. His forces are beyond number, and mighty are those who obey his command. The day of the Lord is great. Who is dreadful? Who can endure it? The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And then Zephaniah uh, chapter 1. The great day of the Lord is near, near and coming quickly. And Nahum 1.6. Who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fires. The rocks are shattered before him. Okay? Now... Think of earthly judgments and his language and anger and fierceness and thunder. Okay, is that the picture you get when you see depictions of the final judgment? Does Jesus say, on that day, many will come to me saying, "Lord, Lord," and he says, "Separate." Is there anger there? There's not. There's not wrath there. I think we're talking about earthly judgments here. I don't think we're talking about anger in order to get a change of behavior. We're not talking about anger in terms of punishment for sin at the final judgment. Do you agree or don't agree? I think it'll be sorrow. Okay. I think God will be Plenty saddened by what's lost. Yeah. Um... You ever have a good friend fail in life? It hurts you as much as it probably hurts them. Probably not as much, but um, it's, it's pretty terrible. Um, suicide is, is pretty gruesome, pretty terrible. I used to work in a medical examiner's office, and um, about one out of every five autopsies were suicides. So, so it was hard to do after a while. All right, so chapter 6, we have these seals. We have these four horses. We have uh, this terror that we see at the end. We have the martyrs that are shown and told to wait. So here's the summary of chapter 6, and see if you like this. Opening and revealing God's plan of salvation will cause the men to begin a holy and perfect mission the preaching of the gospel. Men will persecute those who preach this new message and many will mourn as God brings physical influences on them to encourage them to repent. However, many will die in the body during this period and those who fail to repent will die the second death. That's death and Hades come riding on that horse. Uh, the sentencing to damnation. Those who have died and repented call out for an end to the persecution and for judgment on those who persecute the righteous. Judgment comes and those strongholds, national power and economy, will fall under his pressure for who can stand against God. We take those symbols, we boil it down into this summary. Are you okay with that summary? I'm yeah. struggling with the, the idea of died and repented rather than repented and died. Yeah, I probably typed that wrong. And I, when I was reading that notes, I should have reread it. Um, but yes, I probably should have been the other way around. So maybe it's, you know, a part of this is just not having the historical knowledge, but 
this judgment sounds so intense yeah. that that I could see where people think this is a final judgment. It and if we're saying this is a a, a judgment that's already been fulfilled, you know, when God judged the earth and he, and he and there was a flood, I mean, obviously that was a dramatic yes. judgment. Is, and he says, "I'm never going to do that." Again. Now, right. But okay. When, but when I think of but when I think of the decline of Rome and, and that, I, it, not knowing all the history, I think of it as a, like a gradual... Um, slow decay. Slow decay. And not not the dramatic... Um, right. Not the dramatic things that this the scripture seems to be saying. Right. It's like, you know... The, okay. When I taught Isaiah, guys, how many years before the first prophecy and the last prophecy did it take for all the prophecies of Isaiah to be fulfilled? 714 years. Okay. The fall of Rome, Rome climbed up until about 60 uh, BC and was pretty much over at 414 AD, okay, 500 years. Um, now, okay, some people say, well, it's not really about Rome, and, and you know, my point isn't necessarily that it's about Rome, but what we can take from this is, is I think God still works its way. Now, is he going to influence the world by destroying Rome? You know, one of the greatest, and people still talk about Rome every day. It was one of the greatest civilizations ever. They had a law system. They had a senate system. They had, they had a water delivery system. They had sewer systems. They had uh, yeah, just all sorts of things. They had luxury abounding. Okay, and everybody points to it. And in fact, there's a thing going around now and it says, how many times does your husband talk about the Roman Empire? My wife says, every day. You know, and a lot of you, you know, the things that the building of roads that are still out there today, I mean, and they're they're excavating uh, Pompeii and Herculaneum, and they're finding these beautiful mosaics in the floors and these these holes in their entry. They had an entryway that had little bright colored tiles in the mosaic, so at night when the the flames of the torches were there, it lit up the floor and you could easily see the floor and you stepped into this room and the water fell into this this water cistern that was the water cache for the hot for the house and they could get water from it. Just beautiful place. It was just great. I mean have you ever seen pictures or even been uh, to the um, what's the building with the, the Acropolis? No not the Acropolis. That's Greek. Uh, the big uh, Colosseum? Huh? Colosseum? No, not the Colosseum. Um, <laughs> I can't think of it. It's the it's the largest concrete dome ever, okay? And it's still standing to this day. And there's marble floors and gold this, and the doors that were installed before Christ are still operating to this day. They're 60 feet tall or something. They're just huge doors, and they still operate today. It's just gorgeous. It's beautiful. These cities were amazing. Okay, um, it's quite a fall. Is the United States headed for that kind of thing? Uh, several people say, "Well, these ten leaders, these ten horns that we're going to talk about in upcoming chapters. Well, that's the European Union." You know, everybody points to something of their own time. Well, they've done that since this book was written. Everybody points to their thing. When we had two popes, and we had the Eastern Church and the Western Church, and the popes fought amongst each other, it points to there. We had the, the Western Pope evacuated a city, killed everybody in it, and took it over and made it beautiful, and that was going to be the town he lived in, in France. Uh, just because the Pope had that power. Um, <coughs> some people say a lot of this story is the Roman Catholic Church and the fall of the church. Anyway. Uh, yes, I, I believe that all these symbols relate to the fall of the Roman and, and the early days of the church. 
but it's not to say that those things are still happening. John, who's not here to defend himself today. Hi, John. <laughs> <laughs> On video. Uh, John continually says, it says, yes, but isn't that happening today? Is it a continual fulfillment? Um, i got to be careful about that. These, these elders will smack me and say, well, you know, got to keep people from uh, thinking that all this stuff's about to come take place. But I, I believe prophecies like that. God knows us. He knows how we are. Uh, we're going to be one way today, and we'll forget it yes tomorrow. <clears throat> I was listening to a physicist. I don't remember his name. He was from England. But he says time is circular. Yeah. I mean, then you it know, repeats itself. Yeah, it does repeat itself. I mean, we haven't hardly learned the lessons um, from just a few years ago, much less, uh, you know, 100 years ago. And I think that's one of the biggest, you know, things that in education is we no longer study the classics. We no longer read some of those old, those old books and things. So, anyway. All right, let's move on. Any other questions about chapter 6? All right. This, this part says an interlude. So someone read uh, verses seven, uh, verse, chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. After the vision of these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. The angels were holding the four winds of the earth to keep them from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east who had the seal of the living God. And he called out in a loud voice to the four angels to whom God had given power to harm the earth and the sea. He said to them, Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we mark with a sign the foreheads of the people who serve our God. Okay. All right. So, chapter 7. Where does it stand? You've seen this first horse. You've seen the second horse. You've seen the third horse. You've seen <coughs> the uh, slain at the base of the altar. You've had this impending doom and the, and the mention of the wrath of God and everybody will hide. That's pretty scary stuff. So chapter 7 comes in and pretty much says, wait, 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 hold the presses. I'm going to make sure to keep those who are faithful secure from what's coming. Okay, uh, you will not be moved. Um, so it serves to seal those who are still living unto God. And here, is, as Homer Haley says, um, in these two scenes, God assures His saints that He watches after each one, keeping an accurate account. Ancient times he had assured his people by pointing to the host of heaven and declaring that he brings them out by number, calling each by name, and that for all their number not one was lacking. And, uh, yes, my wife, I have all sorts of typos in this. Uh, Isaiah 40, 26. Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. In Matthew chapter 12, verses 4 through 7, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after killing the body, has the power to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet none of them, not one of them, is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. So in the same way, he's, he's assuring his people uh, that they uh, will not be lost. Now, he's going to hold back this, these angels. Um, he says, he says, there's one ascending from the rising sun. Okay, which direction is the rising sun? East. It's in the east. Okay, so it's a sign of hope. Um, so he, he, the four corners of the earth is essentially saying the whole earth. We get that from I, a number of places in Isaiah, etc. He will raise the banner for all, for the nations. Will gather the exiles of Israel. He will assemble the scattered people of Judah. 
from the four quarters of the earth. Isaiah 24, 16, from the ends of the <coughs> earth we hear singing, glory to the righteous one. Matthew 24, 14 and 31, uh, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, one from one end of the heavens to the other. And in Revelation 20, uh, verse 7 and 8, when the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. The four winds are, waking, uh, are a way of, of um, expressing his, his earthly judgment, full earthly judgment. These winds that these angels are holding back uh, will be judging winds. Um, they will they apply the will of God. Um, Jeremiah 25, 31-33, the Talmud will resound to the ends of the earth, for the Lord will bring charges against the nations. He will bring judgment on all mankind and put the wicked to the sword, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Look, disaster is spreading from nation to nation. A mighty storm is rising from the ends of the earth. At that time, those slain by the Lord will be everywhere <coughs> from one end of the earth to the other. Jeremiah 49, 35 through 36. This is what the Lord Almighty says. See, I will break the bow of Elam, the mainstay of their might. I will bring against Elam the four winds from the four quarters of the heavens. I will scatter them to the four winds, and there will be not be a nation where Elam's exiles do not go. Jeremiah 51, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will raise up against Babylon and against them that dwell in the midst of them, and rise up against me a destroying wind. That's from the KJV, I don't know what your verse says uh, there. Uh, and these winds go forth from God, from Zechariah 6.5, And the angel answered me, These are the four winds, or spirits of heaven, which go forth from presenting themselves before the Lord of all the earth. That's from the Amplified Bible, just to make it... I uh, pick things in different versions sometimes. Um, and he says, but don't harm the earth, the sea, and the trees. The earth is all the world. Uh, sea, again, is society. We've made that conjecture before. What are the trees? Could they mean great men of society? I'm not sure. Um, and another angel ascending from the rising sun, rising of the sun, from the east, the direction and encouragement um, from Ezekiel 11:23. Uh, then the man brought me to the gate facing east, and I saw the glory of God of Israel coming from the east. His voice was like the roar of rushing waters, and the land was radiant with his glory. Uh, so that's part of where we get this great and, and morning sun or morning star. Um, they had the seal of the living God. This one angel, he says, he has the seal uh, of God. So what does that mean? Um, I think I'll stop there. We'll pick up on the start of 72 because the seal takes a while to go through the world anyway. Any, any questions? Comments? Comments, question, concern. You know, you're an intelligent man. You've done a lot of study. <laughs> and you, you know, you make this come to life, I think, more than when I just read. And I think we've always said that at the time, the Christians understood this better. Could be. But I tell you what, without the in them that you've done and all, you know, when we read, when I read the, when I have it, you know, it, it don't make much sense. I mean, well, there's so I'm, much. I mean, I'm hope, for example, I hope I get to play a role and make it sense. Yeah, for example, when I read, when we read from the New Testament, that parallel, you know, that is clear. Yeah. Clear as can be. Clear. But when, when I think when the normal person reads Revelation, it's, it's just yeah. how can that be revealing? Yeah. 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 So. Well, that 
when I bumped into Homer Haley's thing of this, and I was like, oh, I get it, I get it now, I finally get it. I was like, I was so excited. Now, this is my favorite. This is my favorite class to do, uh, just because it's it's so fun. You know, it's like. It's like deciphering a language. It's like a, the why I like ancient Hebrew is because I get to decipher the meanings behind every letter. That's it's like a puzzle. Have you read Burton Kaufman's? Art? Burton Kaufman's. Uh, yeah, uh, I just I think Homer Haley just nails it. It's just my it just fits. Everything. But yet there's a lot of truth in what our good friend John presents. Yeah. Completely dismiss it. I can't. Yeah. yeah. But to follow up what Joe was saying, <laughs> to go through your class on Sunday, and then for me and Rhonda, I know she's not in here, but we'll sit down and, and review what you've done today, and it's it's much easier to understand, uh, and then you read different versions, and. It, 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 start, it starts to get there. You and Pam have done How, how many times have you been in the class? Pam says she has to take a couple of my class a couple of times because the first time she said, I don't know what the heck you said. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's busy doing it. Pam's one of these people that sometimes she's a very visual person. If somebody shows a slide up there, she immediately, her brain immediately moves to that and she starts looking at that thing and looking at what words she can make out of those words and that's just the way her brain is. And she can't listen to us. <coughs> uh, when I start speaking, she goes, mm. <laughs> <laughs> I got a loaf of bread. Joe? Yeah.